and welcome to this public involvement meeting for the Madison Beltline Planning and Environment Linkages Study, or PEL for short. My name is Jeff Behrens and I am the DOT Project Manager on the study. And presenting with me tonight from Strand Associates is Jeff Held. He is the Consultant Project Manager. And the Beltline PEL is a planning study that is investigating potential long-term solutions to existing and anticipated future traffic issues on the Beltline corridor. The purpose of tonight's meeting is really twofold. First, we want to update everyone on the PEL efforts that have been completed to date, focusing primarily on what's occurred since the last public involvement meetings back in April of 2022. And secondly, most importantly, is to get your feedback as the study moves forward. Now there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so if possible, we ask that you hold off on all questions until that time. So on the agenda for tonight, I will start out by giving a general overview of the corridor and the study process. I'll then give a brief update on the Beltline Flex Lane, and then we'll get into the work that we've done since those last public involvement meetings, which includes prioritizing the different improvement components throughout the corridor to create four draft strategy packages. And strategy package is the term that we're using for the potential long-term transportation solutions for the Beltline. After that, we'll get into the next steps for the study moving forward. And I do want to point out we are in the planning phase right now. There is no construction associated with the Pell study planned at this time. So here's an overview of the Beltline Corridor. The study limits begin at US Highway 14 or University Avenue in the city of Middleton and extend approximately 20 miles south and east to County Highway N in the town of Cottage Grove. Average daily traffic volumes on the Beltline Corridor exceed 130,000 vehicles per day in some areas, and there's 18 interchanges along the Beltline mainline that feed that traffic. The Beltline Pell goal was previously developed with input from agencies, local municipalities, and other stakeholders, and that goal is to improve safety and multimodal travel both along and across the Beltline in a way that supports economic development, acknowledges community plans, contributes positively to the area's quality of life, and limits adverse environmental and social effects to the extent practicable. The 12 Beltline Pell objectives were also previously developed, again, with input from various stakeholders. I'm not gonna go through and read all 12 objectives. We do have a display in the back that lists all of those if you wanna take a look but they primarily focus on improving safety, mobility, and accessibility for all modes of travel throughout the corridor. So with the Pell goal and objectives in mind, what we're looking to do with the study is to identify potential long-term solutions for high crash rates on the Beltline, motor vehicle congestion, bicycle and pedestrian needs, transit needs, the deteriorating physical conditions of the corridor, so this would be things like aging or poor pavement and aging bridge structures, things like that. And then also a lack of alternate routes. On this slide is an overview of the Pell process. The first steps in the process were outreach and engagement. I mentioned that we had previously collaborated with various stakeholders to develop the Pell goal and objectives and also to create screening criteria to help identify different improvements that could be made throughout the corridor. Based on that initial feedback that we received, a number of different concepts were developed throughout the corridor to, uh, to address the different needs for the different modes of transportation. So for motor vehicles, bicycles and pedestrians, uh, and transit as well. The different uh, concepts that we had put together are what we are calling components, and those were what were, was presented at the last public involvement meetings back in April of 2022. Now since that time, the Pell study team, again with input from various stakeholders, has been working to evaluate and prioritize those different components into the different level of strategy packages. And those strategy packages will be the primary focus of tonight's meeting. 
So that brings us to where we're at today. Now moving forward with your help, we will look to identify a preferred strategy package or packages that could be then carried forward for more detailed analysis in a National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA study or studies. Before we get into uh, the different co component priorities in the strategy packages, I want to provide a brief update on the Beltline Flex Line, which has been opened almost a year now. It opened in July of 2022. And while the Flex Line is not a part of the Pell study, it is important for us to understand how it's operating and functioning, because that will affect both the development and certainly the timing of any long-term improvements in that area of the Beltline. So the Flex Lane is located in between Verona Road and the Interstate. It is shown in orange on the map here. It's about nine miles long. And on this slide, we'll have uh, high-level safety and operational performance data that was gathered during the first six months of operation, so from July through December of 2022. From a safety perspective, the average number of crashes per month from July through December of 2022 was about 10 fewer than it was for the same months from 2015 through 2019. And what that means is there was a, about a 19% reduction in the average number of crashes per month after the flex lane opened. In addition to that, the average number of fatal and injury crashes per month was down about 19% after the flex lane opened as well. Now we really want to have uh, at least a year's worth of data to do an adequate safety evaluation for the flex lane, um, but based on this first six months of information that we do have, things are looking pretty promising. Next, uh, travel time reliability, and that's the consistency and dependability of travel times on the Beltline. That has improved as well since the flex lane opened. Back in 2019, it would typically take someone anywhere from 25 to 38 minutes to head westbound on the Beltline from the interstate to Verona Road during morning rush hour. After the flex lane opened, that same trip typically took uh, 12 to 15 minutes. So not only a, a real improvement in travel time, but also travel time reliability. All right, so now we'll get back to the Pell study. I mentioned that at the last public involvement meeting, that's where we presented the different uh, components that would address specific issues along the Beltline corridor in specific areas. Those components fall into five main categories. The first category is mainline and interchange improvements. And included in this category would be things like adding travel lanes to the Beltline mainline and improving interchange ramp intersections. Also included in this would be improving weaving areas. And weaving areas are areas where the traffic that wants to merge or get onto the Beltline conflicts with the traffic that wants to get off of the Beltline at the next off-ramp. Next, we have the roadway crossings and connection components. And an example, or what would be in here would be a new uh, crossing of the Beltline that wouldn't connect to the Beltline. It would be a crossing over the Beltline something similar to High Point Road on the city of Madison's west side. Next, we have bicycle and pedestrian components, and this would be constructing a new path to connect areas either along or across the Beltline for bicycles and pedestrians. Transit components look to improve transit reliability both along and across the Beltline. And then finally, park and ride components, and that would be adding new park and ride lots near the Beltline. Now, one thing that I want to point out on here, you see the puzzle pieces. And the puzzle pieces are, are meant to re represent the different component categories. So each, each different category is a piece. And when you put those pieces together, that creates that long-term vision for the Beltline. So it's going to include mainline, or mainline interchange improvements potentially, roadway crossings, bicycle and pedestrian components, park and ride components, as well as transit components. Now the mainline and interchange components were prioritized a little differently than the rest of the component categories. For the number of travel lanes, 
uh, added to the belt line that really varies between each strategy, progressive strategy package. So for example, the lowest mobility strategy package doesn't propose to add any lanes to the belt line, while the highest mobility strategy package would add the most lanes. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. For the weaving areas and interchange improvements, those improvements are primarily based, uh, where they fit in the strategy packages is primarily based on traffic operations. So the areas that have the worst traffic operations are included in more strategy packages, and the locations that don't have as bad traffic operations are included in fewer. The other component categories, so your roadway crossings and connections, your bicycle and pedestrian components, park and rides and transit components were prioritized primarily on four main criteria. And those criteria are how well the component met the PAL objectives, the feedback that we've received through our outreach so far, the estimated or anticipated real estate and environmental impacts of the component, and then how well the component would improve accessibility to nearby jobs or destinations. In the interest of time, we aren't going to go through how each one of the components was prioritized against these different criteria. We do have exhibits here tonight that show that, and they'll also be posted on the website. But in general, the higher that a component ranked against these criteria, the more strategy packages that it's included in. On the other hand, if a component consistently ranked low against these criteria, it's possible that it has been proposed for elimination within the study. And with that, I will hand it over to Jeff Held, who will go through the strategy packages. All right, thanks, Jeff. We've got about two minutes till the HVAC kicks back on, I think. Um, so let's get into the strategy packages. Um, for uh, each package, it's labeled as an SP for strategy package. Uh, what we have include uh, strategy package one, which is a preserve and maintain. Package two, which is, it contains the higher priority components, builds upon package one. Package three is the mid to high priority components. So package three includes everything from package two and adds new components to it. And package four is all the retained components. Uh, so this includes everything from package three and adds in the lower priority components as well that show promise but that we didn't have in the previous packages. The strategy packages propose different levels of improvement that range from one that only addresses the existing infrastructure needs to a package that does everything needed to improve operations along the belt line while also offering the highest level of mobility and accessibility improvements. Note that the section of the belt line east of the interstate was not reviewed on the following slides. Uh, the quarter needs on this section of the belt line are expected to be addressed as part of the ongoing construction project that DOT has going on, which is adding an interchange at County AB. So we'll start with strategy package one, which is preserve and maintain. Package one, the belt line would remain the same as it is today with the flex lane maintained between Verona Road and Interstate 3990. This slide shows the belt line segments that are anticipated to operate poorly in 2050 if no improvements are made uh, to the travel lanes or the weaving locations along the belt line. <clears throat> Excuse me. Poorly operating locations are defined as having a level of service of E or F in the design year 2050. Level of service is a ranking for traffic operations, a scale that runs from A to F, with E or F indicating the roadway is near or over capacity, and backups typically result in slowdowns. So package one has at least 30 locations that operate poorly in 2050. Even the preserve and maintain strategy package has its own associated costs and necessary maintenance to keep the belt line running through 2050. It's anticipated that the pavement from approximately University Avenue to Whitney Way um, and from just east of Seminole Highway to west of I-3990 will need to be replaced. And these sections are highlighted by the thick blue line on the map here. As part of package one, seven bridge replacements are anticipated to be needed by the design year in 2050 due to the age and condition of the structures. These are indicated by a brown rectangle on the map and they include the westbound Terrace Avenue overpass just south of Highway 14 or University Avenue in Middleton, eastbound and westbound Beltline structures over Mineral Point Road, the eastbound Beltline structure over Highway 14 or Park Street, Rimrock Road structure over the Beltline, 
and the eastbound and westbound Beltline structures over John Nolan Drive. In comparison to the other strategy packages, strategy package one uh, would have the lowest amount of impacts and costs. It's also anticipated that with no improvements made other than the necessary maintenance um, and pavement structure replacements, um, there would be no improvements to accessibility along or near the Beltline, and that the Beltline mainline would have at least 30 locations that operate poorly by 2050. Next packages two through four will be reviewed. Um, with pack, starting with package two, the higher priority components. Note that the recent construction of the flex lane and construction uh, due to the recent construction of the flex lane, um, construction of future general purpose lanes between Verona Road and the interstate is not anticipated to be needed for at least 10 years. The timing of the improvements proposed in the strategy packages for this section of the belt line will depend on the ongoing maintenance of uh, monitoring of the flex lane. So this slide shows the mainline improvements proposed as part of package two. The package considers either the flex lane extension or adding one travel lane in each direction from Parmenter Street to Verona Road, as shown in the yellow lines. In addition, the existing flex lane would be extended to the east near uh, I-3990 interchange, um, as shown by the brown lines on the east end there. As part of improving Beltline mainline operations, weave improvements are also needed at specific locations. Uh, Jeff mentioned previously that weaving areas are places where traffic entering the Beltline mixes with traffic wishing to exit at the next downstream ramp. Um, these are areas where typically you see breakdown in operations occur and often there are safety concerns associated with them. The weave locations with the poorest operations for the longest period of time were chosen as part of package two. And they're shown in the three locations by the circled uh, yellow X. So they are located eastbound, on the eastbound belt line between John Nolan Drive and West Broadway, and also between Monona Drive and Stoughton Road, and on the westbound belt line between Stoughton Road and Monona Drive. With package two, it's anticipated that the belt line main line would have 13 to 17 locations operating poorly in 2050. So that's 13 to 17 fewer locations than package one. This slide shows the proposed interchanges uh, for uh, the interchanges proposed for improvements in package two. Interchange improvements are included at Verona Road and Stoughton Road. These two interchanges have poor operations currently and in the design year 2050. Traffic backs up onto the Beltline mainline have been observed at both interchanges at times. Traffic growth at the Verona Road interchange has outpaced previous forecasts due to higher than anticipated development to the south. It's anticipated that ongoing monitoring and data collection will continue at uh, the Verona Road interchange. The Stoughton Road interchange is currently also being studied by a separate uh, uh, DOT environmental study. The highest priority roadway crossings and connections are shown by the brown arrows here. These would be new, ro new roads traveling over or under the Beltline, and they include a crossing west of Whitney Way and a crossing west of Park Street. The highest priority ped and bike components for package two are shown by the green arrows on the map here. The green arrows with a tan outline indicate proposed roadway crossings that would also have bike and pedestrian accommodations. The highest priority ped and bike components include from the west to east, a crossing south of Old Sauk Road, connecting West Town Path between High Point Road and Gammon Road north of the Beltline. The roadway crossing west of Whitney Way that includes pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. A crossing of Whitney Way north of the Beltline a connection between the Beltline path and the Southwest path on the north side of the Beltline, a connection between Seminole Highway and the Cannonball path on the south side of the Beltline, and a roadway crossing west of Park Street that includes bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. The highest priority park and ride locations included in package two are shown by the purple park and ride symbols on the map here. Um, County M and Mineral Point Road, this location is currently under construction as part of the east-west BRT. Um, so that is a park and ride that will be uh, built and open in a couple of years. The others that ranked highest in our priorities are Verona Road at County PD and Fish Hatchery Road at County PD. The interchanges proposed for transit priority in package two are shown by the purple hexagons. These include Mineral Point Road and Fish Hatchery Road, which are planned to be used by the City of Madison's BRT service. Um, we also have Whitney Way on the map here, which is a, another high priority crossing for Metro Transit. By order of magnitude, it's anticipated that package two would have a moderate amount of impact and uh, impacts and higher costs than package one. 
but lower than package three and four. It's anticipated that with two roadway crossings and the bike and pedestrian crossings and connections added, users would see a small increase uh, in accessibility along and near the Beltline. It's anticipated that the Beltline mainline would have 13 to 17 locations with poor operations in 2050. Next, package three will be reviewed. Package three not only includes the highest priority components that we had in package two, but also adds the mid-priority components. Uh, because package three builds upon package two, um, we're just gonna highlight the components that have been added. So the mainline improvements proposed as part of strategy package three are the same as those that were proposed for package two, including either extending the flex lane to the west or adding one travel lane on the west side of the belt line, shown in yellow as well as extending the existing flex lane east to the interstate, shown in brown. Four mid-priority weave improvements were added to package three. They're highlighted by the green circle on the map here. These mid-priority weave locations uh, have the poorest operations but for a shorter period of time than the weave locations that we addressed in package two. The mid-priority weave improvements added in package three include the eastbound belt line between Whitney Way and Verona Road, and also between Fish Hatchery Road and Park Street, and the westbound belt line between West Broadway and John Nolan Drive, and between Mineral Point Road and Old Sock Road. It's anticipated that the belt line main line would have 11 to 15 locations operating poorly in 2050. Uh, this is two fewer locations compared to package two. Six locations were added as the mid-priority interchange improvements in package three. They're highlighted by the green squares they include Greenway Boulevard, Mineral Point Road, Whitney Way, Seminole Highway, Todd Drive, and the Park Street Interchange. Mid-priority roadway crossings and connections that were added in package three are highlighted in red. They include a crossing west of Gammon Road and a crossing of Park Street south of the Beltline. Package three also adds the mid-priority uh, pedestrian and bicycle crossings and connections. The new locations are shown yellow. They include a roadway crossing of Highway 14, south of the Beltline, that includes pedestrian and bicycle accommodations, a connection through the Capital, String, uh, Capital Springs State Recreational Area, and a connection from Monona Drive to Stoughton Road heading towards McFarland. One mid-priority park and ride location is also included in Package 3, in addition to those that we included in Package 2. That's lo that is added at Highway 14, McCoy Road, Lacey Road uh, in Fitchburg. The mid-priority interchanges proposed for transit priority in package three uh, that were added to those in package two include University Avenue, Gammon Road, Verona Road, Rimrock Road, and West Broadway. By order of magnitude, it's anticipated that package three would have a moderate amount of impacts and costs. Um, they would be higher than package two, but lower than package four. Package three has more proposed improvements to roadway crossings and connections and bike and pad accommodations. For this reason, it's anticipated that users would see a moderate increase in accessibility along and near the Beltline. And it's anticipated that the main line would have 11 to 15 locations operating poorly in 2050. So finally, package four. Like packages two and three, strategy package four considers either a flex lane extension on the west side of the Beltline or adding a general lane in each direction, a general purpose lane in each direction, while extending the existing flex lane on the east end as well. Package four also proposes adding a general purpose lane in each direction between Verona, the Verona Road interchange and I-3990, shown here in the red lines. Note that monitoring of the existing flex lane is ongoing. Uh, we mentioned earlier, east of Verona Road, the addition of general purpose lanes is not anticipated for at least the next 10 years. Package four includes weaving improvements at all locations where operational concerns were anticipated by 2050. The additional weave improvements in package four are highlighted green. On the eastbound belt line, they include Old Sock to Mineral Point Road. And on the westbound belt line, Park Street, and Fish Hatchery, uh, Park Street to Fish Hatchery, and between Verona Road and Whitney Way. It's anticipated that package four would have three locations with poor traffic operations in 2050. So to recap, um, the, each of the draft strategy packages. The table gives a quick comparison here, summarizing um, the poorly uh, operating locations within each of them. They range from 30 in package one to three poorly operating locations in package four. So there's quite a, quite a range there. 
Lower priority interchange improvements are added in package four as well. They're highlighted green. They include University Avenue, Old Sock Road, Gammon Road, Fish Hatchery Road, Rimrock Road, uh, the West Broadway Interchange, and also Monona Drive. And this slide shows the roadway crossings and connections included in package four. We had one location that was added from package three. Um, it's highlighted red here. And that is a local road connection between John Nolan Drive and West Broadway, uh, north of the Beltline. All the retained bike and ped crossings and connections are proposed as part of package four. The locations added uh, include a crossing north of Old Sauk Road and a connection between Seminole Highway and the Cannonball Path on the north side of the Beltline. All the retained park and ride components are also included in package four. One location has been added that's at US 14 slash University Avenue in Middleton, just west of the Beltline. Finally, all the interchange locations um, retained for transit priority are part of package four. Uh, the Stoughton Road interchange is highlighted by a blue rectangle. That's the one that's been added since package three. It's anticipated that the ongoing separate study of Stoughton Road would further review transit priority at this interchange. And I'll mention here also that we did consider the network redesign um, that goes into effect on Sunday as part of these rankings. Um, so that's primarily what these were based on in terms of prioritizing where transit priority would have a, a, a good benefit at these interchanges. So by order of magnitude, package four would have the most impacts and the highest costs um, of the packages that we considered. Although it has the most anticipated impacts and costs, it does the most for mobility and accessibility um, in the added crossings and connections for all users. It offers the most transit priority in park and ride locations and has the best possible mainline and interchange operations that we feel are feasible. The Beltline mainline is anticipated to have three locations with poor operations in design in 2050. So with that, Jeff's going to take us through the next steps and wrap up here. All right. So the next steps for the study moving forward. The feedback we get from this set of public involvement meetings will help determine what the preferred strategy package or packages will be. And we'll make that decision over the next few months. Then in the fall of this year, we'll plan to hold another set of public involvement meetings where we'll present the preferred strategy package or packages for public review and comment. After that, we'll make any adjustments that need to be made based on the feedback we get and look to finalize the PEL summary report in the first part of 2024 and that would complete the PELS study. At that time, the preferred strategy package or packages could then be carried forward into a National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA study process where they would be evaluated in more detail. And it's in that study process that an eventual preferred construction alternative would be determined with final design and construction to follow. One thing I do want to mention is that at our next set of public involvement meetings, we'll get into how the Beltline Corridor could be broken up into different smaller segments for that NEPA analysis and eventual construction, and also potential timing of that. So that'll be coming at the next set of public involvement meetings this fall. All right, so I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, one of the main goals is to get feedback. We would appreciate any comments that you have on the study in general, and specifically the draft strategy packages that Jeff went over. We've got comment forms available uh, tonight here that you can fill out and leave with us or take with you and mail to us at a later date. Um, if you do that, we do have postage paid envelopes at the uh, check-in table, so make sure you grab one of those. There will also be an online comment form uh, placed on the study website. Then we also have a draft strategy package online survey, which gets into the different components within each strategy package, kind of walks you through those um, and asks if you agree with what's in there or not in there. And if you disagree, what do you think should be in the different strategy packages that are taken out? So uh, I highly encourage you to take that. You can access that survey by scanning the QR code on the slide here. It's also in the meeting handout, and we'll have a link to the survey on the public involvement page of the study website as well. My contact information is in the handout, and it'll be on the next slide. 
You can always call me or email me with any questions or comments that you have. And we'd like to get all feedback by July 7th to make sure uh, that your comments are included as we determine what that what strategy preferred strategy package or packages will be. I also want to point out that all the exhibits from tonight's meeting as well as the slides from this presentation, uh, the link to the online survey on the website and um, the online comment form, that should all be uploaded to the study website starting tomorrow. I'm hoping that it gets done by noon. So I want to thank you for coming to the public involvement meeting tonight. We look forward to getting your feedback. And with that, we'll open it up to any questions that people have. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I noticed one thing that you had, you're using 2050 as a target here, which is a long way off and contains a lot of assumptions. Uh, did you also look at impacts for like 2030 and 2040 to see what would be then? Is this near term or you? We, we have done that in some areas. T typically our planning horizon, we try to look out 20, 20 plus years right in that area. You get anywhere beyond that and traffic projections get a little more hard to nail down than they are already, and it's not easy already. Um, specifically in the Verona Road area, there's a lot of congestion there that's been occurring lately uh, with the development and with the flex lane opening. We're looking at interim years there for potential nearer term improvements. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Again, we, we need to, this is kind of standard practice, and I, I will say that as something gets put forward into uh, the NEPA study process, we'll get all new traffic information at that time again and reanalyze, and if any emergent technologies are coming out that could affect things, we would look to take that into consideration. So there's, there's definitely more study uh, to be done in the future, but typically we want to look out that 20 years or so from when it would potentially be constructed. Would we be releasing so we can see what the projections are in the near future? We can have we could get that information again. We we have information like that, but um, for what we would look to design to, it's the 2050. So if you've got my my email address, if you're looking for that type of information, you could email me, and we could look to get it put together. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, just want two clarifying questions. So it looks like SP2 would not expand the footprint of the current Beltline, but SP3 could and SP4 would. Is that no, SP2 and SP3 would extend the existing flex lane west to roughly Parmenter Street. Um, so that would be an expansion through there, extending that flex lane. And then SP4 would extend the flex lane west, and there's a small piece east that would go to the interstate, I mentioned that. SP4 would do that as well, but it would also add another general purpose lane, another lane in each direction in the flex lane area, so Verona Road to the interstate. And then you just mentioned that you might segment the project going forward. So does that mean one of these packages would move forward or sections of the package? Well, the idea would be that we would look to move a preferred strategy package or packages forward into the NEPA process where things would be evaluated in more detail. And really within there is where you would have that preferred construction alternative I mentioned. And you would determine there, okay, this piece, it makes sense to break this piece out. Um, it has logical termini and independent utility, um, which are terms just meaning that you could construct it without affecting other areas of the Beltline. So you would look to um, break it out within there, and that's where it would be constructed. So it would be one package or alternative 
but we would break it out because you wouldn't construct the whole belt line all at once. You would find the worst areas most likely and say, we need to get in here and we'll fix this first. And we'll touch on what that could be, depending whatever the strategy package or packages are, knowing that more detailed analysis needs to be done during the NEPA process. Yes, sir. How rigid are these packages? It seems kind of unfair to lump, you know, hundred thousand dollar transit upgrades with fifty million dollar interchange upgrades and stuff like that from a you know saying that they have to be done together or they're gonna be considered together. It seems like a lot of these improvements could be uh, considered outside of their packages. They they could be if needed and, and to get to what your first question the strategy packages aren't rigid at all at this point. That's one of the main reasons that we're having this meeting, and it, hopefully you'll look at the, uh, the online survey that we have. But we want to know, is there something in strategy package two that you don't like or something you feel should be included? And we want to get that feedback so we can adjust those strategy packages. And if, if a need arises before we would get to the, whenever something would be constructed, it's quite possible there could be some interim improvement that's done ahead of time. Um, I don't, there's nothing planned or programmed at this point, but if something rises to the top, an issue that needs to be taken care of, it could be done outside of the strategy packages. But what we're looking here is kind of the long-term vision for the Beltline Corridor and what could and should be included in that. That makes sense. Yeah, and you know we're we're really not to that point yet. And it's we do have on the slides for each individual strategy packages magnitude. Obviously, the preserve and maintain is the lowest. And if you're uh, extending the flex lane, adding another lane to the belt line, plus putting in all the crossings and connections, that's going to be the most expensive. Where we'll get into dollars and costs of things would be in that more detailed analysis in the NEPA process, which is after this one. So right now, what we're looking for is what, in, for you as a user, what would make the most sense or what, what would you like? Does a crossing east of or west of Whitney Way, oh, I would really utilize that. That makes sense to me. Those are the kind of things that, that we want at this point. The dollars and overall cost will come later. We're not to the point where we can uh, throw out numbers yet. No, I, I, it seems to be your, your point right, right there. Um, as a, a, a bike and pedestrian kind of advocate, uh, since 2017, the city's been hamstrung uh, about eminent domain laws. So they can't, all the projects are basically stopped on the tracks. Things like the Beltline Path and so forth are just torn, uh, you know, roadblock. Um, and the DOT with the corridor has the ability to be the knight in shining armor for that. So I'm seeing all those path arrows as being things that the city can't do, the county can't do, but the state could do, and it would be fantastic. Well, I guess I, I will say that Act 59, uh, which is what you're talking about, the state has to deal with that as well. So it's, it, it's making things extremely difficult from a bike ped standpoint. Um, but where we're at in the planning stage, we want to plan ahead for what is going to be, would be a multimodal corridor. And then as something would get further along the line to final design and eventual construction, that's where we would have to deal with that. Right now we want to know what makes the most sense uh, from a, a multimodal standpoint and what should be included in a long-term vision. But yeah, there, there certainly will be hoops down the road if that law does not get changed to be able to put, uh, put in some of these things if, if you don't have a willing seller. It's a, that's a good point. Yes. Uh, did you look at the air impact for any of these on the 
neighborhoods right along the Belt Line? Or Uh, no, we, we, we have not done that yet. Um, I was talking to a gentleman earlier. The, the DOT right now is starting to talk about greenhouse gases. Um, before there was no policy, no law. Um, there's been some projects down in the uh, Milwaukee area that have do are looking at doing or have done a qualitative analysis on that. And so it's kind of new for us right now, um, but definitely something that we need to look at, and our, our, the people at our, our central office, our policy makers, are looking at how we would handle that. I think within the Pell study at this point, we would look at some type of a qualitative analysis, and then I'm not sure how that's going to carry forward as things move forward into the NEPA process, but it is something that is being discussed right now. Yes, sir. Yeah, a um, little bit complicated, but right now I'm estimating that maybe 15, 20 percent of the time is what you're dealing with about the congestion problem of, you know, the hours of the day when we have a problem, 80, 85 percent of the time, the bell line is fine as it is. Uh, I'm wondering how much you've looked at the issues, because you're talking about structural changes here in terms of building things. Um, have you looked at the traffic analysis in terms of when people are getting on and off, uh, where they're going to, and if there could be alterations that might be able to be built in terms of when people travel uh, that might impact this and alleviate the need for all this extra building. You know, some people may be getting off on one interchange and then two later getting off if they're in front of you, that might deal with that. Um, you know, when people work and so on, or if they're going to be working, if they're working home more, altered times and so on. I know there's a lot of businesses and what's involved with that, but, you know, and also if it's because, oh, there's a grocery store here and that's part of the traffic this time, people going there, if there's another grocery store here, you know, so involves city planning and stuff like that too. But are there other alternatives or have you looked at the traffic volumes and rationales for where people are going and how there might be changes implemented that could impact that and impact what would be needed in terms of development. Yeah, and Jeff, you might want to speak up on this because Jeff was involved uh, earlier on when there was a very large origin destination uh, study done on the Beltline corridor. It was a number of years ago, but basically looking at where people are going on the Beltline. Um, you know, typically what we look to do is we, we design for the peak hours, uh, which I think is kind of what you're getting at. And, um, you know, as far as Encouraging people, uh, all we could do from a, a work standpoint is encourage businesses to maybe stagger work hours to see how that would uh, affect things, but we don't necessarily really have any control over that. As far as what you were mentioning with you know the grocery stores here and there, I think that's what those crossings and connections, they wouldn't tie into the Beltline, they would go over the Beltline, so maybe somebody uses that to get to the Target or the grocery store instead of getting on at one interchange and then getting off at the next one. And same thing with the bicycle and pedestrian components that we would look to cross or um, connect along the Beltline. It's a way to get people out of those interchange intersections and get the, provide them another safer route. So I th that's kind of what those components are looking at. And I don't know if I exactly answered your question there, but given the payment that you are potentially adding and so on, you know, and obviously there are also issues about the money, the money is dealt out, but you know, can we look at a larger framework of this and develop more innovative solutions that might include added transit and stuff like that that would alleviate a lot of the need, and obviously it's not just your beaches here, but um, yeah, that's something, I, you know, I don't know within this PAL study, 
but certainly potentially down the road in the NEPA study when they start getting, you know, would take a look at more detailed analysis uh, of those different crossings and connections and how things would work and updated traffic information. Um, that's certainly something that we can make a note of. Yes, sir. It, it is one of the technology things. I guess one thing that I would say, um, and I, it's possible that, say, for the extend flex lane option, that could be, could be an HOV lane. We've done some analysis that um, it, it would work, it, it would improve operations as an HOV lane. It would be better if it was just a flex lane, but you know, there, there would be flexibility to do something like that if you did add add a lane in a certain area. You could look at it being in the HOV lane. Um, there's the possibility of that. That's not something necessarily that we would get into within this Pell study. Again, that, that might be down the road, but uh, there would be the possibility of that. Yeah, well, Verona Road, there's been a, a lot of development to the south of there, um, and it has grown a lot quicker than was anticipated, and that's feeding into the issues that you're seeing for traffic heading westbound, turning southbound, and that's where you typically are seeing those backups. Um, so that is something that within our, our interchange improvements that we're looking at and um, that's one of the things where maybe we would be looking at some type of an interim improvement that would happen sooner than what we're talking about within the Pell study, just because there have been issues there. So it's something that's under analysis right now. I've heard of the term reduced demand, and there's some question about whether it really exists or not. Do you think Verona Road is a case of reduced demand by improving that interchange and speeding the highway there that's really encouraging growth to the south? Different people have different opinions on that. I, in, in my opinion, there's a, there's a business down there that has been growing uh, quite a bit, and, and that is fueling the, the, the traffic issues in there. I'm not blaming. It, it, there's just been a lot of development going on. Um, you know, what, whether or not it's uh, induced demand, it's kind of, that's one of those things that's hard to quantify. I guess related to that, I will say that we are going to do what's called an indirect and cumulative effects analysis, um, where we'll bring in experts from different municipalities to talk about the different strategy packages and how they might spur development in outlying areas and what that could do to the belt line. So that'll be coming up later this summer as well. So it is something that, that we do want to make sure we're taking into consideration with the study. All right, well, we will be available at the displays if anybody has any additional questions. Again, I want to thank you for coming. Please make sure to get us your feedback and tell others that the Beltline effects, if you know people that the Beltline effects, please have them take a look at the um, information on the website and give us their feedback as well. Well, thank you. <laughs>